Going, Going, adapted by Peter Cates from George, a short story by John Anthony West. A television set downstage, it's back to the audience. It is turned on, although we cannot hear the sound except as a ghostly whispering. The light of its actions is reflected in the actors' faces. Two chairs upstage of the television, facing front to the audience. One is an easy chair with a hassock, the other slightly more upright. Between them is a table with a lamp. The lamp is on. This is the living room. That is, all that needs representation in this play of George and Marjorie. At rise, they are sitting, George in the easy chair and Marjorie in the upright one, both watching the television. Marjorie is knitting, and both occasionally eat peanuts from a dish on the table. After a time, George grunts and massages his foot. He puts it down and watches television, eats peanuts, massages it again, grunts again, rises and tries to walk on it, staggers a bit, hops about to increase circulation. Sitting in the same position too long. He starts hopping again. George, you don't have to make such a fuss about it. I can't help it. Have to wake it up. Everybody's foot falls asleep. My foot is asleep right now. The least you can do if you must hop is hop out in the hall. I'll be <laughs> goddamn if I hop out in the hall just to wake up my foot. You're being childish again. Childish? What's childish about waking up my foot? Childish? It's your attitude that's childish. Attitude? I'm trying to wake up my foot. What does attitude have to do with that? Just sit down, dear, and forget it. It will pass. He You're stops right. hopping and glares at her. Long pause. He looks at her but can think of no rejoinder. You're right. It will pass. He limps back to chair and sits, watches television, eats peanuts, rises and takes a few hops, but Marjorie glares at him, so he sits again takes off his shoe and massages his foot. George! What? What do you think you're doing? I'm massaging my sleeping foot. Suppose somebody comes. Nobody ever comes. But suppose someone does. Suppose they do. And you're sitting there with your shoe off. Can I take my shoe off in my own home? But you only took off one. What's the difference? You're completely insensitive. They resume watching television and eating peanuts. George thumps his foot on the floor. Marjorie glares at him. All right, I know I'm being silly, but I can't watch the program when my foot's asleep. Other men could. You have no intestinal fortitude. <laughs> oh, that's easy for you to say. It's not your foot. If it were I, I wouldn't make such a fuss. Men are big babies. It isn't your foot. George sighs, sits back. They continue to watch television. George puts his foot across his knee and rubs it very hard. Marjorie, my foot isn't asleep. Then why are you making so... There, there's something wrong with it. Oh, George. No, I'm serious. Look, I can't move it. It's stiff. He wrestles with his foot, tries to wiggle his toes. See, it won't move. You're holding it that way on purpose. No, I'm not. Takes off his sock, wrestles with his foot. Look, my whole foot is rigid. You're doing that on purpose. You just want sympathy. Please, Marjorie, listen to me. See, I can't move it. You're not trying. I am trying. I should know when I'm trying and when I'm not. You try to move it. I don't want to play games with your sweaty foot. <laughs> my foot is not sweaty. In this weather? All right, it's sweaty, but I can't move it. Just try and move it. I believe you. You can't move your foot. You don't believe me. I can tell by the tone of your voice. Your foot is asleep and you can't move it. I believe you. It is not asleep. There's something wrong with it. Sleeping feet don't just go rigid. You are such a hypochondriac, George. Every little thing. Like the time you thought you had appendicitis. And it was just gas. How could I know? It might have been appendicitis. I was lying there in agony and- Well, it wasn't, and you're not in agony now. Your foot is asleep, and you have to make such a big deal of it. Well, sleeping feet don't go stiff. Maybe it's very soundly asleep. He glares at her. Maybe you sprained it. How? I don't know, where did you walk today? Just the usual, subway to the office, and then I walk to the water cooler twice, no, three times. Aha! Uh -huh. Usually you go to the water cooler only twice. But I went to the men's room only once. That makes up for it. 
How was I supposed to know that? Let's forget the whole thing. Still, you can overstrain a tendon and not know it. Remember Geraldine Roberts? She fell down the subway stairs and broke three ribs and didn't know it for a week. I didn't fall down any stairs. I didn't overstrain any tendon. And Geraldine Roberts was stewed to the gills when she fell. So, your friend Walter is a complete lush. We're not talking about Walter. He rises and hops about. She watches him. Does it hurt? No. You walk like a war hero, George. I'm not a war hero. I, I don't want to walk like one. How could I be a war hero? I'm draining recruits in New Jersey the whole time. You could be training recruits and a nervous private, private drops a hand grenade. You leap on top of it and then... I was training them to use a calculating machine and that can't cause a stiffened foot, especially not after. Marjorie! Marjorie, my other foot's gone stiff. I can't move it. He hobbles about on two stiff feet, looking horrified. George, please, you mustn't get so excited. Sit down. It will pass. Don't make such a fuss about every little thing. Fuss? Little thing? Good Lord, you think I was just anybody. Me, George, your husband. Suddenly I'm, I'm paralyzed. I can't walk. And you don't say don't make a... Of course you can walk. You're walking right now. Okay, you call this walking? Look. Is that what you call walking? Millions of people would give their right arm to be able to walk <laughs> that well. What the hell do I care about them? I'm me, George, and I can't walk. I get leprosy or something, and you just sit there you and- don't have leprosy, George. If you had leprosy, your feet wouldn't stiff and they'd fall off. He gets up and waltzes around the room singing. Leprosy, leprosy, <laughs> my God, I've got leprosy. There goes my eyeball right into my highball, leprosy. Shut up. Shut up. Can't you see that I'm frightened? I was just trying to cheer you up, dear. She goes back to her chair. Now look, it can't be anything serious. If it were, there'd be symptoms, right? There is no serious disease that doesn't have symptoms. So why don't you just go to bed and forget about the whole thing? Your feet will be back to normal in the morning. George ignores her and continues to hobble, hobble and limp around the room. Pause. You have no idea how foolish you look. You think I care? You might at least try to appear to behave like a gentleman. Appear. Appearances. Always appearances. Women are all the same. Intrinsic value means nothing as long as it looks nice. That's not true and you know it. Nothing was ever more true. You eat horse manure if it came garnished with parsley. I would not. You would too. I wouldn't. You would. Wouldn't. Would. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't. Would, would, would. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't. Wood, 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 wood! Wouldn't, 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 wouldn't! They stop, out of breath. George collapses in his chair. Good God. Here my feet are paralyzed, and we sit talking as if nothing is wrong. What am I going to do? The first thing, George, is to relax. Don't get so excited. If you were a professional tennis star or something, I could understand. But all you have to do is just... Get laugh. to the office. As long as I bring home the bacon, you don't care how I... President Roosevelt had to get around in a wheelchair, but that didn't stop him from... You don't understand. You don't understand. I do understand, George. Believe me, I do. Within a week, you'll get the hang of it. Besides, it will all be better in the morning. No, it won't. You know it won't. You're just saying that to cheer me up. Nobody had this before. It... Nonsense. It happens to lots of people. No, name one. Well, I don't know any personal, <laughs> but I just, I know. Well, that. If I just knew what it was. George, I. She well, stops, nothing to say. You're right. No use getting excited. Let's watch the program. They watch television. George keeps jiggling his feet. Then he mutters. Something's wrong with you. You go running for the doctor. George, it's 9.30. You want me to call the doctor at this hour? I didn't say that. He rises and walks about the room, testing how it feels. You implied it. If it's not better in the morning, we'll call him then, all right? Marjorie. Oh, Marjorie, my knee. Now it's my knee. I can't move my knee. See, it's 
completely stiff. She jumps up and helps him to his chair. George, relax. Please relax. I'll go and call the doctor. You just relax. Relax? How can I relax? An hour ago, I was a normal man, a happy man. I went about my business. I didn't bother anyone. And now, now, good God, I'm a cripple. Look at me, Marjorie, a cripple. I'll call the doctor, George. She notices that he is sitting with his legs straight out and adjusts the hassock under it. No, n now. Not now, later. Go, go and call the doctor, please. It's fine this way. Call the doctor. Suppose someone should come in, and you sitting there with your legs sticking out? They'll think you're crazy. He moans. She goes out. He sits there. Uh, Pause. Marjorie, what's taking so long? I got the wrong number. I'm trying again. George waits, and then... Marjorie, for the love of God, my other knee, my other knee is paralyzed. Hurry! Oh, please, please. I can't carry on two conversations at once. Just relax. But Marjorie, my knee. Marjorie. Well, well, what? What do you think? Well, what did he say? What is it? Just as I told you, nothing serious. He knew what it was? Of course he knew. Did you think you were the only one? Did you think that you're the only one who has that? I mean, all right, all right. But what did he say? Tell me what he said. What is it? Atrophy. 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 Plain, common atrophy. Just atrophy. So that's it. Atrophy. Well, at least we know what it is. I told you. I told you, it was nothing, it was not knowing that scared me. So what do we do about it? Nothing. 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 You mean to tell me that I have a fatal disease? I have a fatal disease and you sit here calmly and tell- George, get a hold of yourself. There's nothing fatal about it. Nothing fatal? The doctor said not to worry. Nothing can be done about it, but there are absolutely no dangerous effects. Oh, well, that's a relief. He relaxes in his chair, except for his feet and knees, of course. Pause. Nothing we can do, but there are no dangerous side effects. Right. There, you can do anything you would do normally, except move. Well, that's something to be saying, thankful for. Except move. You'll have to have courage, George. We'll have to have courage. We'll have to fashion a whole new life for ourselves. I can't face it. It happened so quickly this evening. I was a man in his prime. I could do everything I wanted. Now, we now. We can start from scratch, George. We'll start from scratch. I can't walk anymore. I can't do a simple stroll. You never went out for a simple stroll. When did you ever take one? That's not the question now. I can't even if I want to, and I was planning on it. When? This Sunday. Uh, ha. Huh. No, I was. I was going to walk around the block. You know you wouldn't have gone. No, I was planning to. There's nothing on the other side of the block anyway. Well, how do you know? I've been there. And there's nothing? Well, hardly anything. But I wanted to see for myself. George, take my word for it. There's nothing interesting to be seen. But... You'll have to stop thinking this way. You can't give in to self-pity. Twitches suddenly as, as his thighs atrophy. My thighs, Marjorie. My, my thighs just went. I can't move them. Have courage, George. Please, for your sake, for my sake, have courage. Yes. It could have been worse. <laughs> Suppose it had happened in the subway or tying my shoelace or, you know, painting the ceiling. You're wonderful, darling. Keeping your sense of humor. Complaining won't do any good. She begins George! To... Please, dear, keep calm. I don't like this any better than you do. I can't go bowling anymore or fishing or play ball. Nothing. George, you never went bowling. You never did any of those things. No, true, but I, I'm still young and I could have done them. I can't play ping pong. You never played ping pong. But I always wanted to. You can't work. What will we live on? We have to eat. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. I'll work, George. Don't worry. We'll get along. I'll do anything. I'll take and wash. I'll, 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 I'll scrub floors. I'll work in a millinery shop. Don't you worry. I'll, I'll keep us going. George, let me see now. Yeah, I've been. Yeah. 
uh, let me see now with our social security, uh, company benefits, disability, all our insurance policies. I figure we ought to get, let's see, I figure our income will be increased by about $40 a week. The price we have to pay. Not bad at all. You can buy the things you've always wanted. My own needs will be less. He reaches for a peanut. Marjorie grabs his arm, puts it back on the armrest. Don't do that. Why not? Who knows? Any minute now, you'll be reaching for peanuts the rest of your life. Oh, Marjorie. I'm serious. If you want something, ask me for it. I is there anything you want? You can still move about the w above the waist. Would you rather lie down? This is fine. Are you sure? Remember, any minute, wouldn't you rather... This is better. I'll be able to walk. I'll be able to talk to my friends and watch television. How about the program? Do you like the program? Would you rather see something else? She grabs the uh, listings. There's boxing. Would you like to watch boxing? Well, leave it the way it is. You know I can't stand boxing. I like this. I'd love to see it. Look, Rocky Florio versus Kid Garver, welterweight. I'd love to see that. You wouldn't. You hate boxing. Because I never understood it. Teach me, George. I'll learn to like it. Another twitch. My waist. Uh, it hit my waist. <laughs> Marjorie begins to cry. <laughs> Why won't it stop, George? Why won't it stop? Why us? Why not someone else? It's selfish thinking, Marjorie. It's the sitting around that's so awful. Sitting, watching it happen. It would be different if I went out to a movie or, or shopping and came back and found you atrophied. But this, this dying by inches. I'm not dying and you know it. Don't get emotional. He raises his arm and she leaps up to set it back on the armrest. Don't do that. Tell me what you want, George, and I'll do it for you. It's, it's a, such a small thing. Anything, no matter how small. Will you scratch my nose for me? She does so. A, a little higher, please. Ah. A whole <laughs> lifetime ahead, and you'll never be able to scratch yourself. But George, I'll always be here beside you to scratch for you. No, <laughs> when it's set in, there's no sensation at all after a few minutes. Oh, George, a whole lifetime ahead of us, and you'll never know what it is to itch. <sighs> You know what I will miss, Mar miss? Making myself snacks for the Late Late Show. I'll make you snacks, George. Marvelous snacks. No, you don't quite understand. It's not the same thing. You see, when you go to bed early, I stay up for the Late Show and then the Late Late Show. And in between the two, I get hungry and the house is completely quiet. So sometimes I hear buses down the avenue. Once in a while, an ambulance or a fire engine, it's... Siren screaming, I'm all alone. And I go into the kitchen and I switch on the light. It takes a second for the fluorescence to catch. And then I'm alone in the bright, shiny kitchen. Everything is clean and tidy. I'll do my best. There's no food in sight. All I can see is spotless countertops, gleaming refrigerator, maybe a drain board with a whole world of midnight snack lights up before my eyes, herring and wine sauce herring and sour cream, odds and ends of cheddar, pimento olives, cheese spread, a quarter cantaloupe, half a thing of cream cheese. I go through everything. I look around, I pick one out, and then I put it back. There are dishes with covers in them, little things that were left over and we've forgotten about. One by one, I take off the covers. There's a meatball. Oh, two slices of roast beef. I look at everything. I don't choose yet. I go to the bread box. There's half a loaf of rye, three or four kinds of crackers, and still I don't choose. I go to the pantry. There's peanut butter of all kinds and jam, some sardines, and perhaps tuna fish or salmon. Still, I don't choose. I go to the cabinet with the breakfast cereals. There's cornflakes. They weren't there yesterday. Cornflakes. Did I see peaches in the refrigerator? No, yes. I, I don't remember. I run to the refrigerator. Mm. There are peaches. I'll have cornflakes with peaches and cream. No, George, there aren't any peaches, but there are strawberries, nice big ones. You can have cornflakes with strawberries instead. Ah, oh, well. I, I never knew it meant so much to you. I, I never dreamed. It was a small thing. It makes small a small thing. gesture when she stops. The small things are the most important. No, really, it, it doesn't. He shudders as his left arm atrophies. My arm. 
my left arm just went. Marjorie weeps silently. George sees she isn't looking and grabs her peanuts with his right arm, stuffs them in his mouth. George! I made it! You mustn't do that. Do you want to give me heart failure? You know what could happen. One second more. But I made it. Nothing to worry about. Promise me you won't do it again. I, I promise. But I had to reach for my last handful of peanuts. You have more courage than most men, George. No one could ever say that my husband is a coward. It was nothing. Don't be modest. You know perfectly well that most men would have just sat there. Men with less character would have hesitated. His right arm atrophies. You see, that split second, other men would have, and in that time, poof. But you, George, you defied fate. I go all weak inside when I think, oh, George, I, I, George. What is it now, Marjorie? Our lives. Our lives are ruined. Now don't start that again. You have to stay there in that chair the rest of your life. We don't know that, dear. She goes to him, leans very close. You don't. I, I don't think you know what that means. You can't ever leave. Well, of course I know that. You don't understand. You don't see. We can't fight City Hall. We have to face the realities. George, George, you don't understand. You don't see all the time, never to leave. You'll have to bring me my food and vacuum around me. I still don't see why you have to get so excited. You can't come to bed, George. Oh, yes, I hadn't thought of that. Well, with a couple extra blankets, I'll be warm here. It won't be as bad as all. And me? I'll have to get between the cold sheets alone. Oh, uh, now, Marjorie, a couple extra blankets and you'll be warm enough. <laughs> How obtuse can he be? <laughs> we can't make love anymore, George. We can't be lovers anymore. True, I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> never, never again. Oh, George, that was the best part, George. In your arms, the little light night light glowing. You always said such silly little things. I loved you most then, and it's my fault, George, all my fault. If I had been a little bit more understanding before, when it was just your foot, we could have had one last chance. We would have had time, one last chance. It doesn't seem so much to ask. But we didn't think of it. There's no use crying over spilt. It's all my fault. I didn't think, I didn't dream, oh, George. We just didn't think of it, Marjorie. I didn't, you didn't. Besides, it isn't Wednesday. <laughs> all our quarrels were made up there, George. Whatever the day, the nights were all soft and tender. In your arms, I was a princess at dawn beside my sleeping prince. It was perfect, wasn't it? Oh, yes. We were passionate. How passionate we were, like lovers. Not like husband and wife. Every day was an experience. Wasn't it, George? Every night, eight hours of paradise. We were happy, so very happy. Weren't we, George? Oh, yes. We did it together. What lives we led. Everyone envied us. We made life so exciting. We never bickered, never fought like other couples. We were happy, weren't we? Yes, we were very happy. Good nights, George. How will I get through the long nights alone? We're so young, George. Our lives were all before us. So young. I'm 32, George. A girl, a young girl. And you, 34. Your life had just begun. Marjorie. Yes, darling. Are you sure I'm 34? I'm certain. Oh, George. That's funny. I always thought of myself as older. Oh, George. You know how it is. One day is like the next. A year goes by and you don't notice. And then five. His neck atrophies. My neck. It's all over, George. Our lives are finished. There's nothing left for us. Shifting but his gaze to look at her. That's not so, Marjorie. We could still talk. Yes, we still can talk. That's right, George. We can still talk. Talk to me, darling. Talk to me. I 
can't just talk. I, first, I have to have something to say. <laughs> yes, of course. But when you think of something, you'll talk to me, won't you, George? Promise me? She hovers uh, over him. You mustn't worry. I'll always be beside you whenever you need me. Swell. <laughs> I'll stay by your side always. I'll never leave you for another. I'll refuse all invitations. I won't let myself be tempted. George, look at me. I can't. My eyes are focused straight ahead, atrophied, and I didn't even know it. Well, it's almost over. Thank God for that. But, but George, are you, are you blind? Can you see? Yes, I can see. Are you afraid, George? No, no, I'm not afraid. George, that's not your normal voice. Not that, too. George, talk to me. I'm frightened. Say something. Some last thing. Don't, don't leave me like this. Tell me what it's like. What do you feel? George, tell me. Tell me. Uh, it's not so bad. Not bad at all. I, I, I sort of like it. And curtain. <laughs> Excellent, ladies. Okay. Any thoughts or comments? That was wonderful. <laughs> that was weird. <laughs> <laughs> and it was weird. Apparently, the guy who wrote the original story was pretty weird. Um, like I said, yeah, I, I don't know this story, but I'm interested to read it now. Yeah, I, I tried <laughs> to find the original story, and I couldn't find it, you know, for free online. But I, I did find um, he was apparently well known as a as an Egyptologist and a bunch of other um, things, and so. I, he is in Wikipedia if you care to look him up. Moving on to impressions, a one act play by Jackie Martin. Yay! Yay! Okay. <laughs> Setting in time, the interior of Ashby's Galleria, an upscale art gallery on the Upper West Side of New York City. Suggestion settings can be suggested with minimal dressing. Uh, yeah, really. <laughs> Over the course of the few hours in one evening, present day winter. Okay. A dialogue should be fast paced. At the Rise, the interior of a high-end art gallery, Ashby's Galleria, on the Upper West Side of New York City. The guests mill about in formal attire, while Daphne, dressed in plain black pants and a white shirt, serves champagne and hors d'oeuvres. Mrs. Ashby, owner and curator, surveys the scene anxiously. The door opens and Walt enters the room. He is fully bundled in a large winter coat, hat, scarf, mittens, etc. Mrs. Ashby sees him come in and approaches him. Excuse me, we're closed to the public tonight. I'm here for the Millie St. Charles show. Uh, the show will be here for six weeks, and you're welcome to come back during regular business hours. This is a closed premiere, invitation only. I have an invitation. You must be Camelia Ashby. I've seen your picture before in the, in the ledger, of course. And you are? Um, sorry, I'm trying to page down and it's not with me. I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Walt. Nice to meet you. Walt offers his hand. Mrs. Ashby does not take it. And after a moment, Walt continues searching his pockets. Here, here, I'll show you. Let me just... Walt takes off his gloves, scarf, hat, and hands them to Mrs. Ashby. He removes his outer coat and then a zip-up sweatshirt and piles those on Mrs. Ashby as well. He is dressed in dark skinny jeans, a button-up plaid shirt, a bow tie, and suspenders. He looks nice, but certainly less formal than the other guests. He reaches into a shirt pocket and produces an invitation. He reads it out loud. You are cordially invited to Ashby's Galleria for the world premiere of Miller St. Charles' newest art exhibition, The Color of Light. Please bring this invitation for entry. He shows it quickly to Mrs. Ashby before putting it back into his pocket. I have just as much right to be here as any of your other guests. Mrs. Ashby considers uh -huh. him for a moment and then takes a deep breath, sorry. Alex. Alex throws over. Mrs. Ashby piles Walt's outerwear onto Alex, who is also still trying to hold a clipboard. 
Please take Mr. Walt. Please take Mr. Walt's things to the code room and see that he gets a glass of champagne. Mrs. Ashby turns and walks away in a huff. Walt begins to move about the room looking at the art on the walls until he is approached by Daphne. Champagne, sir? Daphne offers to hand Walt a glass. Walt flinches. Is everything okay, sir? Ah, uh, yes, sorry. Thank you. If I'm being honest, I have expected you to throw it in my face, you know. He mimes first throwing a drink and then getting a drink thrown into his face. Sir? You don't seem to, to be like the drink throwing type or anything. I, I didn't mean any offense. Of course not, sir. It's just Camelia Ashby, I got the ice queen treatment. And I guess I thought maybe she had a way of uh, dealing with surprise guests. Oh, no, no. This is very fancy, very expensive. We only throw the cheap stuff. <laughs> In that case, he takes the drink from Daphne. Don't worry about Mrs. Ashby. She's nervous. I'm not sure women like that get nervous. Oh, she's nervous. Trust me, sir. Please, you don't need to call me sir. I think I'm, what, five years older than you or something? Uh, it's a job thing. It's not an age thing. Well, I'm begging you, please. If Mrs. Ashby's around... Then by all means, sir it up. What is she so nervous about? I realize this is a big opening. Oh, it's not the opening. Uh, do you know Jonathan Bixby? He's coming tonight. And? Well, come on. I, I mean, Jonathan Bixby? He's a billionaire. Uh, not just a billionaire. A billionaire recluse, which, let's face it, makes him way more interesting. She invites him to every single opening, every show. But this is the first time he's accepted. Alex told me Mrs. Ashby nearly fainted when she got the reply. Why? Well, he's one of the most wealthy, most famous men in the world. He's a businessman who knows nothing about art. Why would anyone care about his opinion? Well, they don't. They, they don't want him here for his opinion. They just want him here. You know, his mere presence will elevate the status of Ashby's and everyone associated with it. Walt looks blankly at her. Okay, I get it. You're too cool to be impressed by wealth and power and fame. But look around you. These people feed on that stuff. Uh, to them, Jonathan Bixby is the golden calf and the prophet and God all wrapped into one. Well, what would you say if I told you I am Jonathan Bixby? I would say you're either delusional or you think I'm an idiot. Jonathan Bixby is about a hundred years old. Okay, fair enough. I'm Walt. I'm Daphne. And I better get back to work. Ashby is giving me the stink eye. It was very nice to meet you, Walt. Daphne hurries off. Walt turns his attention to some placards on the walls next to the paintings. Carter Bloomfield, an arts reporter for the New York Ledger, dressed in formal wear, is walking around and taking some notes while his fiancee, Shalane Williams, drinks from two flutes of champagne. Mrs. Ashby approaches, Alex and following immediately behind. Alex, is that Carter Bloomfield? Yes, ma'am, from the Ledger. I know where he's from. Why did they send Bloomfield and not Michael Northrop? Mr. Northrop moved to LA, ma'am. Bloomfield is the Ledger's main arts reporter now. What does Carter Bloomfield know about art? Well, he wrote about all those TV shows and movies. That's not art. He's a glorified gossip columnist. Well, not anymore. Oh, God. This is what I'm working with. And on such an important night. There's a bright side. He brought Shalene Williams. Am I supposed to know who that is? Only if you ever watch television. She was one of the finalists on Primal Love a couple seasons ago. Primal what? Primal Love? You're kidding, you've never seen it? It's that reality show where women compete in these vaguely prehistoric challenges for a chance to marry this guy, the caveman, you know? And then they have to live in these weird huts out in the middle of nowhere. Oh, I don't care. Right. Um, well, she was on that, but she's managed to turn it into a whole thing. She's a celebrity, C-list, but climbing. I'm a love. People watch this? Tons of people, and they love Shalane. I hear she's in talks to get her own travel show or something. 
well, let's make sure this little celebrity has a good time. She watches as Shalane downs one of the champagne flutes. But maybe not too good a time. Mr. Bixby should be here soon. And I don't want him slipping in a pile of C-list vomit. <laughs> Shalane, you said? Shalane. Mrs. Ashby approaches the couple. Come to Bloomfield. What an honor to have you here for our little show. Ah, Camilla, nice to see you. This is... Shalane Williams, of course, no introduction needed. Is it true that Jonathan Bixby it is coming? Is. Holy crap, I'm like dead. Are you like still standing? How are you? Are you crazy nervous? Nervous? <laughs> no, no, no. Jonathan Bixby, I mean, can you even? You have to admit, Camilla, Jonathan Bixby is not your everyday guest, even for Ashby's. He pulls out his phone, presses record, and puts it to her face. How did you get him to agree to attend? I sent him an invitation. That was all. I suppose when Ashby's gallery calls, the upper class emerges. Hey, that's not a bad opener. Gallery, yeah with an I-A. But he's like one of those, what's it called? Well, he never goes anywhere anymore. You have to be thrilled that he's coming here. It's a crazy amount of exposure for your gallery. Is it? I have not considered that. Now I'll need to introduce, now I need, I'll need you to introduce me to Mr. St. Charles. And who is that over there, that man? Is he someone I should meet? Oh, do you know, that is, an unfortunate error. Apparently, properly addressing invita invitations was too taxing for my assistant. I didn't. Alex, go and check outside to see if Mr. Bixby is arriving yet. Alex goes. I'm terribly embarrassed on her behalf. How young people today manage to get through university is beyond me. How difficult is it to copy names and addresses from a list? But here we are. Oh, now, Camilla, it's disappointing to be sure, but I'm sure it will all work so out. Freeze. He'll realize he's out of his element and go. Oh, what happened? What? Uh, uh, I just hope it's before Mr. Bixby gets here. I don't want him thinking we'll let in just anyone off the street. You make an excellent point. Exclusivity is the key to success. <laughs> Damn, Carter, that's deep. I'll drink to that. <laughs> Walt approaches Daphne, who's refilling trays at the serving station. Any tacos over here? This isn't really the taco crowd, sir. <laughs> I have to be honest, I sort of thought you'd been kicked out by now. I'm biding my time. What do you think of the show? I've only seen a couple of paintings so far. Well, then you can go. I mean, they're all pretty much the same. I'm sorry. Interesting turn of events. Are you an art critic in disguise? No, I'm a caterer. <laughs> Forget I said anything. I shouldn't have. No, I'm really intrigued. Tell me, what do you see that no one else sees? I mean, this is a Miller St. Charles original, brand new. What do you think? There's a long pause while Daphne and Walt look at the painting. Daphne squints, cocks her head to one side, then the other. She stands back to look at the entire thing, considering the painting carefully before making her judgment. Meh. <laughs> meh? People all over the world would take offense to your meh. They'll be itching to own this canvas. St. Charles has made a fortune off of his art. Oh, I know. I have a print in my apartment. Which one? Girl Walks on Water. It's my favorite. I'm a huge fan of Miller St. Charles. Well, his early work. And his current work? I don't know. I mean, Girls Walks on Water may have been his really last great painting. The lines, the movement. I, I mean, it's abstract, but you can clearly see her. Uh, you can feel her joy, her weightlessness. I it used to be that way. I mean, seeing a Miller St. Charles could make you believe. It assaulted you with emotion, but this thing, I, I mean, you can find something like this in any dentist's office. It's just white noise. I couldn't figure out what it was, why it wasn't all that impressive to me, but hearing you say that, it makes perfect sense. You know what you're talking about. 
Well, or champagne, escargot? Uh, no, and definitely no. Thank you. What, the snails aren't to your liking? Sandra St. Charles saunters up behind Daphne, who continues. <laughs> I know, they look like snot, right? <laughs> I mean, honestly, I don't get these people. How do these nasty little things become associated with wealth and class? I mean, what are these people? Seagulls? You'd think they'd be eating tiger meat or something. I mean, something powerful. Sandra clears her throat, <clears throat> alerting Daphne to her presence. Daphne turns to her. Champagne? Uh, escargot? Sandra takes a glass and stares at Daphne until Daphne awkwardly walks away. It's usually the same old crowd of these things, but I haven't seen you before. I recently moved back to New York from Cambridge. Oh, England? No, Massachusetts. Ah, oh, well, that explains the wardrobe. <laughs> yes, I... what? Tell me, Cambridge, what do you think of this painting? <laughs> this one? Well, truthfully, miss, I'm not terribly impressed with this painting or any of the others. Daphne, still nearby, hears him and stops. She glares at him, trying to subliminally send him a warning. Oh, really? No, they're nothing like his early work, you know. He sees Daphne, but believing she's annoyed that he's stealing her words, he smiles and winks at her and continues. Those paintings, they, well, they made you feel things, didn't they? The artist had a point of view, something to say. These new pieces are pedestrian. Pedestrian? Yes. I fear our acclaimed Mr. St. Charles may be a sellout. Either that or he's out of inspiration. Maybe his muse has left him. Maybe years ago we had some beautiful woman in his life that inspired greatness. And now she's gone, dooming him to a life of throwing paint around with no real meaning. Or maybe she's just turned into some horrible slag. Maybe we'll never know for certain. I'm Walt, by the way. Hello, Walt. I'm Sandra. Sandra St. Charles. Hell, oh. Yes, isn't this a funny little moment? Miller! Miller St. Charles approaches. Walt, I'd like you to meet my husband and the man of the hour, Miller St. Charles. John, you with us? Oh, sorry. No problem. Uh we're on page 15. Okay. Oh, I'm ahead then. <laughs> okay. And Sandra St. Charles? Yep. So you're oh. Walt, eh? You've been looking at this painting. Okay. Um, do, 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 do. It's your first line on page 15. On my copy, it says page 16. Really? Yeah, I don't know why. I don't know why either. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if that makes a difference. Um, I don't know either. Mm. Sorry, who am I again? You are Miller. Miller, okay. All day, you've been looking at this painting for a while. You're enjoying the show? Oh, Walt here has all sorts of thoughts about the show. <laughs> Don't you, Walt? Really? What sorts of thoughts? Go on. Mrs. Ashby has noticed this gathering and begins to approach, listening nervously. Daphne hurries away as Mrs. Ashby approaches. Oh, I don't think I ought to. Nonsense. A man with such strong opinions should have the fortitude to air them publicly. What's that? Don't you like it? Walt thinks you're a sellout and that I'm an evil old witch that doesn't inspire you anymore. Well, that's putting words in my mouth. Not really. What's the meaning of this? 
Uh, Mr. St. Charles, please come with me. I'd love you to meet Carter Bloomfield from the New York Ledger. He's right over here. Not now. What did you say about my wife? <laughs> I, I wasn't talking about your wife. I was talking about your muse. You think I'm not his muse? I don't know. I didn't realize she was your wife. She's so, and you're so. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mr. and Mrs. St. Charles, please allow me to have this man escorted out. Now, wait a minute. That's not going to happen. I have every right to be here. I was invited. You can't just kick me out for having an opinion. I can kick you out for causing a scene. Me? I'm perfectly calm. He's the one turning purple. He's right, darling. Take a breath. Don't tell me how to breathe. Look, it doesn't matter what I think. If you feel that your work is true and organic and beautiful, then what does it matter what anyone else has to say? You're right. It doesn't matter what you think. Look at you. You're nobody. You're probably the only person in the world who doesn't see the majesty in, the, in this painting. <laughs> Well, that's not exactly fair. I'm not even the only person in this room. Daphne, come here. Daphne, who is across the room, stiffens. I'll stop and look toward her. She turns slowly. Daphne, tell him what you told me. All eyes are on Daphne, who smiles nervously. I just said that, well, I said that Girl Walks on Water is one of my favorite paintings of all time. and that its beauty overtakes me every time I look at it. Not that, the other thing about the dentist's office. I don't know what you're talking about, sir. She said. Is. Right, I said that if I were in a dentist's office, uh, uh, then I'd be lucky if this painting were there because uh, it would calm me down to see the beautiful colors. Oh, remember? You said it was like all the other paintings. Hmm. I'm supposed to be offended then? I'm supposed to be sad, is it? That some bum off the street and a waitress doesn't understand my genius? But who decides what's genius? What's genius to you may be, what was it, Daphne? White noise to others. White noise? All I'm saying is that what makes good art is subjective. You know, beauty and the eye of the beholder and all that. That old nonsense, silliest saying there is. Beauty is obvious. Don't tell me you believe those old platitudes. Beauty is the universal language. I mean it. Look at you and then look at me. You and I could not be more different, but we are both men. You know beauty when we see it. We can't help but have a physical reaction. Are you saying that your paintings give you a... I'm saying that sp spouting some crap about beauty being subjective or worse, being on the inside, it's not just doing anyone any good. People like to think they fall somewhere on the spectrum of beauty. But the truth is, if a person is not, beauti is not beautiful, or if a painting or a suit of, or a building is not beautiful, it's just not worth as much. You knew that as well as anyone, that when you chose to show up here today, dressed like a hobo, you were going to stand out. You say you sent me an invitation. Did you read it? Did you just gloss over the dress code? Or do you not know the meaning of the phrase formal attire? No, not you. I just met you but I can tell you're a man who deliberates. I wear what I feel like wearing. It shouldn't matter. It's your first impression, like it or not. What you wear tells the world what you, you think of you before you ever open your mouth. You came in here tonight wanting to make an impression, the impression of someone who doesn't care about dress codes. And how could we take that as anything but disrespect? Disrespect for my work for this galley, or the social code. You want us all to see you as someone who thinks differently, someone too good for the status quo, that you're not a unique snowflake, young man. I could get off the train at Bedford Ave 
and they see 20 different versions of you before I make it the street level. All of you walking around like you're somebody interesting. Do you feel, Mr. St. Charles, that this young man represents a certain misunderstanding of, or perhaps rejection of standards among <laughs> millennials? Oh, Carter, you're not actually writing about this. Are you kidding me? If Bixby doesn't show soon, this might be the <clears throat> most interesting thing to happen tonight. Excuse me? Other than the superb paintings, of course. I mean, the color, the light, you know, of course. The immediate aesthetic appears to be that of Impressionism, but as anyone looks closer, one sees a pragmatic approach similar to that of the, of the classical Italian painters. There is societal commentary here within the sub subtleties and intricacies of the bigger picture. It's integral. Here's a man who knows what he's talking about. Yes. But at rambling, you can't be serious. Nonlinear, influential, demonstrative. <laughs> now he's just yelling adjectives. Here it is again. You waltz in here and say negative things just to be negative, just to dissent. But I see right through you. I know you understand beauty just as I do. Look at my wife, for instance, and then put her next to the waitress. Manila, you're being unkind. That's, there's too much dishonesty in this world. We need to tell the truth like good art does. No offense, darling. You do in a pinch. Daphne, horrified, leaves. Walt follows. People get their feelings hurt so easy these days. <laughs> that was cruel. And what about you, putting that man on the spot? What kind of game are you playing? I wanted him to see how foolish he was being. Liar, you wanted me to feel foolish. You thought you could bring me down a few pegs, eh? Show me someone that doesn't like my work and get me all riled up. Stop, you were saying such nice things about her a moment ago. I said she was beautiful. It's a fact, not an endorsement. More blood pressure, Miller. She'd better be beautiful for how much of my money she puts into it. She fits around all day, sipping cocktails and pulling at tiny wrinkles in the mirror. And she resents me for my acclaim because I'm an artist and she's nothing. Oh, she won't speak against me, not openly, but she's sneaky and vindictive. She finds little snippets of criticism of my work online. She'll print them out and leave them around the house for me to find as if I'm supposed to be bothered by what some fat, no talent misfit writes from his mother's basement. Miller Good stops Lord, and puts are you his, all right? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Miller stops and puts his hand on his chest, taking a deep breath. Good Lord, are you all right? You're far too old to be acting like such a child, Miller. You know, that fellow back there didn't know a thing about my muse, but maybe he was right about my wife. Scene two, Daphne is sitting against the wall on the steps outside the gallery. Walt enters sheepishly. She ignores him. Hey, so that was what he said back there. He was way off. Right. You're, I mean, I think you're very. Don't. We don't know each other. You don't have to check on me. Well, I feel bad. I kind of pulled you into that. You 100% pulled me into that. I did, didn't I? But you got back at me by throwing me under the bus and then watching as it dragged me along behind it. But that was your own fault. If you had to open your big mouth, you should have left me out of it. Mm -hmm. I'm here to serve hors d'oeuvres, not to comment on the art. I'm invisible. That's silly. Just because you're working doesn't mean you can't have an opinion. It's literally what Mrs. Ashby tells me before each show. You're here to serve hors d'oeuvres, not to comment on the art. You're invisible. What did you think I was going to say, anyway? I thought you'd say what you speak. I thought you'd speak your truth. You said it so perfectly before. Not in front of the artist. What kind of artist can't handle criticism? Is this the first actual artist you've ever met? <laughs> He may be, actually, now that you mention it. Oh, well, maybe you should stick to breweries and bookstores from now on, Hipster Joe. Hey, hey now. I love art. 
I just don't like lying about art, although certain other people don't seem to mind it. Okay, you can come down from your soapbox now. What are you so afraid of? We're getting fired. Catering is your big dream job, huh? Who the hell do you think you are? I'm sorry, you're right. That was rude. Look, I've never had a problem saying what I think, and I forget that some people have a filter. I'm sorry. Also, I followed you because you're far more interesting than any of those paintings. Oh, that is quite a line. It's not a line. I'm not, I mean, I'm not hitting on you. If I were, my husband might have something to say about it. Oh, well, then compliment away then. You are the only person here who has been even a little bit kind to me. You're pretty funny. I thought that thing about eating tigers, that was pretty funny. You're discerning. I can tap dance too. And you're beautiful. Please don't let that windbag in there make you feel like anything less. I don't. I mean, that was gross, but I'll get over it. Besides, it's no use comparing me to someone like Sandra St. Charles. I mean, the woman married a very wealthy man, and she's got access to plastic surgeons and personal trainers. I mean, you really can't compare her situation and mine. I don't care that he called me plain. What bothers me is that he's a complete jackass. <laughs> I see. What kind of monster says those things out loud? I mean, I knew that people thought that way, but to actually speak it with no hint of self-consciousness? He's a dirtbag. Worse than that, he is a disappointment. One of his paintings hangs on the wall across from my couch. And sometimes I just sit and stare at it. And I wonder, you know, where did it come from? How did he put brush to canvas and make a whole story come to life in, in this one frozen moment? He's been a hero to me. And even if I haven't loved his work lately, you know, I figured there had to be something so good in him to have painted something like that. I mean, there's magic in it. I can look at it and then close my eyes and suddenly I'm the girl. I mean, I can walk on water. I would give anything to make someone feel like that with my paintings. You paint? Well, catering is not my, my dream job, but it gets me in the door. But what good is it to get in the door if you're invisible once you're in the room? Uh, well, I haven't figured that part out yet. But there are always important people here, you know, artists, buyers, and patrons. And maybe one day I'll be in the right place at the right time and I'll get to talk to some of those people and they'll listen. And maybe one of them will give me a chance. <laughs> that probably sounds pretty stupid. It doesn't. It's just that I don't have a ton of opportunities. So I'm trying to find them where I can. You know, if you don't have a lot of money or power, if you don't have connections, well, you sort of have to find a way to slip in through the cracks. Well, um, maybe tonight is my lucky night because Jonathan Bixby is coming and maybe he's in the market for a new trophy wife. <laughs> you are overqualified for that particular position. What do you paint? Oh, uh, well, yeah, I do have some pictures on my phone. Oh, can I see? Yeah, but well, it's hard to see them. Obviously, I, it's not the same as seeing them in person. And like, I'm not sure if they're any good. I, I, mean, I feel like I have a long way to go before. Stop apologizing for your work and let me see it, please. He holds out his hand. Daphne starts to handing him her phone and stops. Be nice. Walt takes the phone and looks through. He takes some time zooming in on areas of the first painting, then moves to the next. Daphne takes her cigarette back out and plays with it nervously. Daphne, these are beautiful. Really, really good. Arresting. Look, I know I said to be nice, but you don't have to overdo it. <laughs> I'm being serious. I'd love to see these in person, if you don't mind. But I can tell, even from these photos, that you're very talented. Well, that's kind. I Thank you. <laughs> Do you work out of a studio? Not yet. I I'm looking for a studio to rent. 
but there are waiting lists to get on the waiting list. And even then, it seems to be all about the people that you know. And that's why I keep this gig. I mean, if I can meet the right person, someone that will give me a chance, it'll have been worth it. She sighs, looks at her watch. <sighs> Breaks over. Daphne holds her hand out and Waltz puts the phone back in it. She looks at it for a moment and puts it in her pocket too. Daphne, I just realized I met you before I met Miller St. Charles. So? So I was wrong before. You're the first artist I ever met. A smile creeps over Daphne's face. She starts to walk away, then turns back. Are you sure you're not hitting on me? I'm sure. <laughs> because I have got to say, if you were... <laughs> oh, I know. I'm very good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Really pretty good. Okay. Okay. Well, I've got to get back to my snails. Scene three. Back inside the gallery... An hour has passed. Mrs. Ashby is near the door, but anxiously looking between it and Carter, who's interviewing Miller St. Charles. Sandra is seated near a back wall, looking bored out of her mind. And Shalane is taking selfies near the art. And, okay, I'm going to take Sandra now because um, Karen's internet is going somewhere west. All right, Shalane, go on. Miller, we need to take a picture together. I can't believe we don't have one yet. Come here, honey. Shalane, I'm in, right in the middle of this interview. Oh, you and your boring old interviews. This photo will get a thousand times more action than your little newspaper. Please. All right, then. Miller stands stiffly while Shalane holds out her phone, taking photos and striking poses at Miller's side. Mrs. Ashby, any Bixby sightings? Not yet, but he'll be, but he'll be here. It's been almost three hours. How long am I expected to wait here? Do you have someone better place to be? The Color of Light is my first new show in eight years. That's the story, not this hermit millionaire. Billionaire. <laughs> oh, of course. Forgive me. I should have known you'd be anxiously awaiting his arrival. Planning to upgrade, are you? <laughs> well, let's see if I make any objection. Of course, your show is the big story here. Mr. St. Charles, that's why we're all here tonight. That's why Mr. Bixby is coming. He's an <laughs> admirer of your work. <laughs> Walt snorts. <laughs> what? What now? Uh, ignore him, Mr. St. Charles. Well... I'm trying, but he's just always there. <laughs> Look, I'm sorry, but I don't think it's right to lie to you. Jonathan Bixby has no idea who you are. I'm sure of it. Don't be offended. It's not you. It's him. He doesn't know a Michelangelo from a Warhol, honestly. He said time and time again that the arts are a waste of resources. And I suppose you have had lengthy conversations with him on the subject. You have no place in this discussion. You shouldn't even be here. I have an invitation. Yes, my assistant is an idiot. <laughs> Hold on. I I'm sorry, Mrs. Ashby, but, well, I was going to wait until later, but, I mean, if you want, we can talk about this in the office, but. Land the plan. Land the plan, Alex. <laughs> sorry, do we land the plane? <laughs> 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 Land the plane, Alex. <laughs> Not an idiot. I double-checked the list against the return receipts, and I know I sent an invitation to the exact address you provided. So how did he manage to get one? Walt removes his invitation and hands it to Mrs. Mrs. Ashby, who turns it over. This invitation is addressed to Jonathan Bixby. Where did you get it? His house. You stole it? It was given to me by his wife. I told you, he doesn't care about art. He's not interested. It was just sitting in the office gathering dust. Wasn't even opened. I asked Helena about it, if she was going to go. Well, she wasn't really interested either, so... What in the hell are you playing at? Walt pulls out his wallet and hands Mrs. Ashby his driver's license. Jonathan Walter Bixby? Junior. There is a long pause while everyone looks at Walt and each other. You're Mr. Bixby? No, I'm Walt. 
Oh, Mr. Bixby, you have played a prank on us. <laughs> Carter, Shalane, Miller, and Sandra join in on the laughter nervously and gradually. I haven't, actually. This fellow, he's quite, a f he's quite funny, isn't he? Letting us go on and on about Jonathan Bixby and the whole time, here he was. You were talking about my father, not me. Do you see? Hilarious. Oh, maybe he fooled the rest of you. Oh, please, Miller, you did not know. Of course I did. I knew him right from the start. How could I not? A man of wealth and class. Really? You were pretty insulting. Merely a prank of my own. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to see the look on your face. And I did. I got you. Uh, you thought you could come in here and fool everyone, but you can fool Miller St. Charles. So, I made up my own game, you see, to show you what a good sport I am. Pretended not to care about your opinion. <laughs> uh, uh, when, of course, your opinion is the one that matters most here. We're two of a kind, you and me. Both pranksters, eh? I knew you were just joking around when you said my show is pedestrian. Oh no, I'm sorry, but I wasn't joking. <laughs> what? It's just my view, one man's view. You shouldn't let it hurt your ego. My ego? And what ego is that? No, Mr. Bixby, you didn't hurt my ego. I appreciate the constructive criticism. I'd be uh, interested to hear hear more of your thoughts. That's very big of you, Miller. Very big of you. To be perfectly honest, looking at the painting longer and longer, I have to say, I agree with Mr. Bigsby here. There's no, what's the word? Meaning? Soul? Yes. How interesting. I had no idea Mr. Bigsby was such an insightful critic. I'm not that insightful. Daphne is, though. Sorry, you know her as the waitress. <laughs> I suppose the things you said about her were a joke as well? Only if she's a secret baroness. Stop trying to make me into a fool. <laughs> you don't need my help for that. Mr. Bixby, if you could join me over here to discuss your thoughts further on the show and art and New York and the world in general. We don't know anything about you, after all. You've been hiding on us, a mystery, like your old man. And what a headline this will be, the heir to the Bixby throne. Oh, no, you misunderstand. I'm not heir to anything. What do you mean? What did you say? I'm a Bixby in name alone. My father and I don't get along. I guess that's putting it mildly, really. I barely speak with him. Only go over there to check on Helena and their kids, Make sure he isn't making them too miserable. He's been holding his fortune over my head for years, threatening to cut me out completely every time I make a decision he doesn't like. I finally had enough of it a few years ago and told him to go ahead and write me out of his will. Of course, of course he didn't actually do that. He did, and I've been much happier for it. So what you're saying is, Miller? You're nobody. There you go. I'm Walt. So you did steal the invitation? I told you. His wife gave it to me. He wasn't going to come. Does his wife know that... that does he know that... His, I'm sorry. Does he know that wife of his is going through his things, giving his, his, his ne'er-do-well son a free pass to steal his identity? You claim to hate him. But you certainly didn't mind passing yourself off as... Can't you just, I don't know, call him and get him over here? We're not exactly close. Besides, he hates everything about art. Thinks it's a waste and that artists are a drain on society. <laughs> a drain on society? A drain? You've upset Mr. St. Charles. <laughs> everything upsets Mr. St. Charles. You think this is funny, don't you? You're probably in on this. Did he tell you who he was? Before you called me over to meet him, did he tell you? Mr. St. Charles, let me get you some water. Get away from me. You don't care. None of you care. Making my work, my life. 
We weren't. Remember how I said I thought it was, what was it? Meaningless? Soulless? No, not that. Before, <laughs> when I said it was brilliant and exciting. Oh, sure, you said that. And then you jumped right on, into the Bixby hangwagon. Oh, he locked up. Yeah. Sorry. So I oh. Go ahead, Shalane. Oh, please. What about you and your little prank? I don't know what you're talking about. Miller, calm down. Don't tell me to calm down. You're supposed to take my side, no matter what, some way. Ha! Why do I even keep you around? She signed the prenup, you know. I think she'd be a little more careful. I could leave you tomorrow, and you'd be nothing. You wouldn't. I'll file the papers first thing. Just watch me. You think I can't find someone better than you? Someone younger? I'll have them lined up. I'll be shacked up with them within a week, and you'll be sleeping couch at your sister's house. Miller! And with nothing to your name and no future, you have nothing without me. You're nothing. No talent, nothing to contribute. That's why you hate me. You despise my ability, my acclaim. All of you do. Don't bother giving me your tired excuses, your old party lines. I know now how you truly feel about me, how you truly feel about my art. You don't care that I put my heart and soul countless hours slaving over these canvases? Well, you threw some paint up on those canvases and called it art. It only took you an evening or two. You were right, you know. His only goal is to sell. He hasn't been inspired by anything but a paycheck in years. Well, if you didn't spend all of my money on Botox and, and handbags... Miller stops. He clutches his side, then his chest, then takes a breath. If you didn't... If you... He collapses. Oh, Miller! Daphne, call 911. Puts his cheek to Miller's face. He's not breathing. Scene four. An hour or so later, Miller's body has been taken away. Mrs. Ashby paces the floor. Alex is bringing coats from the coat room and trying to attend to guests. Daphne and Walt sit aside. Shalane comforts Sandra, who looks shaken, but not necessarily in despair. Carter is speaking into his phone recorder. And so the first Miller St. Charles art show in eight years would also be his last. The man died as he lived, surrounded by admirers, loved ones, and the vibrant color of his imagination. That's not so bad. Any uh, last quotes to the article? Well, I suppose you'd like to f know how <laughs> I feel about giving my husband a heart attack. Oh, rubbish. He gave himself a heart attack. Besides, I don't need to include any of the fighting. That's not the story anymore. I don't care, you know, if you do include it. It would just muddy the waters. This will be a touching farewell to a revered artist written by a humble fan. I'll really fluff it up, you know? Probably front page material might even get me some on-air interviews. Forgive me for saying so, but your late husband is going to make me famous. And Shalane, I'll need one of those photos you took with him for the article. I didn't even realize I am in the possession of his last photo ever. Thank God I didn't post it yet. I'll have to make the caption really touching. TMZ is going to be all over this. We'll, and we'll get some shots of the gallery too, Mrs. Ashby. A photographer from the ledger will come by tomorrow morning. Now, you now have in your possession the last works of Miller St. Charles. That's right, I do. Oh, goodness. I can increase the price on these now that he's back. Do you all hear yourselves? His widow is sitting right there. I'm a widow. I, I can't believe it. A widow is really dead. I'm going to be so rich. You 
are all terrible people. Who don't lecture us. It's so easy for poor people to be judgmental of the wealthy. You don't understand the kind of pressure we're under. That's probably why you're so terrible to your poor father. You don't appreciate him. Come into the back, Sandra. Let me get you a cup of tea, and then my driver will take you home. Unless you want to go to the hospital. What for? He's gone. No point in visiting. We've got to get back so I can start writing this thing. What an evening. I could go for some tea if you're offering, Mrs. Ashby. I'm not. Just go. <laughs> and you will not be receiving any more of my business. Are we clear? Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Ashby and Sandra go to the kitchen and Carter escorts Shalane out. I'm sorry about your job. It's okay. After tonight, I'm not sure I would come back here. And I'm sorry about, well, everything else. You're not angry with me, are you? I wasn't trying to lie to you. I was having such a nice time talking. And the moment people find out who my father is, they tend to, well, you saw it for yourself. You didn't lie to me. Not really. I do feel a little stupid about some of the things I said. Please don't. You weren't wrong. Maybe, if you're free, I could see those paintings in person now. Hell no. They're at my apartment, and apparently I don't know the first thing about you. Let's grab something to eat. I know you weren't eating the snails. <laughs> we can talk about setting up your show. My show? What do you, own a gallery or something? Did I not mention that? Are you messing with me? <laughs> Wait, you own a gallery? Well, it, it's not open yet. We're in the middle of renovation. Levi and I closed on it about six months ago, but you know, the red tape and all. That's why I'm here, actually. I was hoping to network a little, get some ideas, talk shop. I thought maybe I'd get a few pointers. But tonight has been much more eye-opening than I could have imagined. I've been floundering a bit, but now I think I have a clear direction, and it's because of you. Me? Yes, what you were saying before about how difficult it is for new artists. So I'm thinking, why don't I make that my market? I'll host newer artists whenever I can, and I'll renovate the second and third floors into studios that I can rent out. Wait a sec. Do you own the whole building? Don't be ridiculous. I bought out the first three floors. But you said... I said I don't have access to my father's money. I've made some money of my own, though, and my in-laws are well off. They were able to float us alone for, well, you're not interested in all this financial stuff. Well, I sort of am, though. <laughs> Look, if it were up to my dad, I'd be building a hotel empire or a cheesy restaurant chain. But my mother loved the arts, and she taught me to love them. So I've got the desire and the means. I could use your help with the big picture stuff, if you want in. I do. Well, I think I do. I'm almost certain. It just, look, Walt, I feel like I've met you three or four different times tonight. Honestly, I don't know what to make of you. Good. Don't decide yet. I make a terrible first impression anyway. Give me a few days at least, then you can decide. About me, about the art, about whether you love it enough to put up with the types of people that decide if it's worth anything. He gets Daphne her coat and helps her with it. So, dinner? Yes, I'm starving. But you're buying. I'm unemployed. Tacos? They better be some fancy ass tacos, Mr. Bixby. Noted. They begin to exit. I'm taking black truffle oil. That's expensive, right? So I'm told. Well, I'm an artist, so I've got expensive tastes. The tacos will be magnificent. Color and light. Integral, not derivative in the slightest. Nonlinear, influential. Demonstrative. And blackout. End of play. Yay. <laughs>